she was playing the hymn, the verse came to my mind, all my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. I thank him for changing me. Yes. I thank him for keeping on me, and he's still changing me. I thank him this morning for the word of God. I thank him for this church that we have to come to. It's such a blessed privilege to come and listen to the word of God, to the things of God. Because as we listen and as we conform to his word, he makes us more like Christ. And he keeps changing us. They was there by the shores of turn in our Bibles this morning to the uh, book of 2nd uh, Chronicles. I want us to look at 5, 6, and 7 in our study today. I have been praying about the direction of the Lord since we finished a series of messages in the book of Joshua. And I feel that the Lord has impressed me at least preparation for our camp meeting to bring a series of messages on the revival. It's very important to remember that we started the Heart Cry for Revival camp meeting 44 years ago because we were 
passionate about God doing a mighty work among us. And if you'll remember, God just uh, manifested himself in mighty power uh, after about five years of ministry here among you. And uh, the things that I reviewed in my heart and mind through the course of this week have aided me to worship God. Uh, let me take a moment and just say to you that when God gives revival, he's not doing something to entertain people. But I promise you the people of God will learn to enjoy God. Yes. Uh, we find in the catechism that the first question is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, of course, that we have learned and heard through the years is the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I guess the question should be that we would ask to start with, uh, is it true in your life that you're doing what you do to the glory of God? And let me ask the question, do you enjoy God? I drove 12 hours yesterday, starting at 6 o'clock in the morning, and drove straight through from Oklahoma. And it was really a tough day for me, but I want to say this to you. I enjoyed God all the way. There is a blessed thing when we as the children of God learn to glorify God and enjoy our God. So this morning, as we start this series of messages, I want you to turn with me in your Bible to 2 Chronicles. I want to read uh, a little bit from chapter 5, and I also want to read a bit from chapter 6 and 7. Notice, if you will, as we stand in honor of the Word of God in verse 1 of chapter 5. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Now the marvelous thing here is that when they brought the ark of the covenant into this new temple that had been built they were bringing in the throne of God. And I want to emphasize that in our study because the dwelling place above the mercy seat is where the glory abode. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast, which was in the seventh month, and all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. They brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord unto his place, to the oracle of the house, and to the most holy place, even unto the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubims covered the Ark and the staves thereof. And they drew out the staves of the ark 
and the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracles, but they were not seen without, and there it is unto this day. I want to mark verse 10. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables, which Moses put therein at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. I want you to notice something that's interesting. Number one, there, were, there was placed in the Ark of the Covenant the Ten Commandments, also those two tables of stone. Also, there had been placed in there the pot of manna that had been collected in the wilderness journey, and Aaron's rod that had budded. But it appears at this point in time a change is made. Only the law of God is placed in the Ark of the Covenant. We'll explain some of that as we go along. Verse 1 of chapter 6, Then said Solomon, The Lord hath said that he would dwell in the thick present, uh, excuse me, the thick darkness, but I have built a house of habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. <clears throat> And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth to his father David, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build and house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem, that's a blessed thought, that my name might be there, and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Israel. Now in chapter 7, verse 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And I would not neglect the fact that the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. In these writings you will find much emphasis is placed upon the bloody sacrifices. Let me say this to you. Anytime God breathes in revival, the cross of Jesus Christ is the center message. The emphasis will always be upon glory to the Lamb of God. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll aid us in the study this morning. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll exalt yourself. Glorify the Lamb of God in our midst is my prayer. And God, again, as we study the Word of God together, will you not give us enlargement? Speak to our hearts. Grant us the mercies of the presence of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Be seated. When one starts speaking on the subject of revival, 
there is often a great deal of confusion. And these days that we live in, uh, we need to ask the questions as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is revival? When is revival? When can it be expected? Will the revival last? How do we know when we have had revival? I guess the best way to defend, excuse me, define revival is to declare what it is not. First of all, I would say revival is not a series of meetings. We see signs put up everywhere. <laughs> it always vexes me. It says, revival here. Monday through Friday evening at 7 o'clock. There will be no Saturday revival. That always moves me a lot. In fact, it angers me. But it's the ignorance that is seen on every side. Revival is not a spiritual phenomenon that quickly passes away. Let me say revival is not to be confused with evangelistic meetings. Richard Owen Roberts says, mass evangelism is work men do for Christ. Revival is work that Christ does for men. Let me say to you, we strongly believe in the Great Commission. And we should carry the gospel to the end of the world. But I'm gonna say this to you. The power of the Holy Spirit in revival will purge the church that she'll be more efficient at it. Looking here in the Word of God, I find that much emphasis is put upon two things in particular in this context, and that's fire and glory. When we see fire in the Scriptures, it's important to understand that fire carries with it the purging power of Christ. Whereas the glory of God is manifest, is the manifestation of God's attributes to his people. We have experienced some moves of God at Peachtree Baptist Church in years gone by, and I can honestly say God brought glory down, and we were very much aware of the holiness of God even the love of God, the hatred of God, the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God, amen? God manifests his attributes when he comes down in power. Uh, Roberts goes on to define revival as an extraordinary movement of the Holy Spirit producing extraordinary results. I was uh, impressed some time ago, I preached some messages from the book of Acts on revival and the outpouring of the Spirit of God and uh, Eliezer picked up the phrase uh, in that uh, message speaking of uh, Acts chapter three and verse 19. Uh, where it says, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he took that, and his newsletter as a missionary now is in time, titled, The Refreshings of the Lord. May God be pleased to give it to him and all of India. Can I hear it? Amen. But let me back up and make this statement, James Edwin Orr says the best definition of revival is found in Acts 3, 19, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. I believe the most important thing for us to understand this morning is how precious the presence of the Lord is in making worship a reality, making the purposes of God in the Great Commission and in our worship become a reality. 
Richard Owen Roberts was once told by an authority on the history of revival. Your study on the history of revival will never bring revival. And he looked at him and said, Amen. But neither will ignorance about revival bring it. I believe that we're living in a generation where we need to be searching the scriptures to see what it has to say for us in these last days. We are taught to worship God in spirit and in truth. The spirit of revival burns off biblical truth. I was talking some years after God had moved in our midst to the late Dr. Ava Rogers. He was in a meeting with us and I said to him, I said, Dr. Rogers, it seemed that God did so much in our meeting and for those weeks we had the presence of God and the power of God and today I look back and I see how great God has performed in results since that revival. The things that God has accomplished amazes me. Uh, you say, why? All the difference is the presence of God. Yes, sir. All the difference is the power of God. And I want to simply say to you, Dr. Rogers said, Pastor David, keep preaching truth. The revival will spread as far as truth is known. It burns off of truth. Thank God for godly doctrine. Thank God for the whole counsel of God in his word. Thanks be to God that he has enabled us through now 48 years of preaching and teaching the word of God here to raise up others that believe in preaching and teaching the word of God and believe that's what God moves, how God moves among his people. I stood in the pulpit administered the word of God last week in uh, Smithville, Oklahoma. And I preached in Oklahoma before, but never when I sensed the presence and the reality of the Holy Spirit anymore. The pastor there is a graduate of Georgia Baptist College. And uh, Brother Brandon White, and he's such a gentle soul. Uh, for anybody to go out and labor among Choctaw Indians, they've got to have the grace and the help of the Lord. But what a gentle soul he is. I watched him work with those little Indian boys, amen. And I watched him as he handled the truth of God in the pulpit. I watched him as God moved with him and he looked out at the congregation, tears streaming down his face. It's only the presence of God that accomplishes the purposes of God. I have learned that doctrinal truths come in cycles. You say, what in the world do you mean? Well, I've been preaching over 50 years and in over 50 years, uh, the emphasis seems to come out in the church in certain ways. Uh, I remember in the 60s, the great emphasis being upon the second coming of Christ and eschatology. And I mean, we were experiencing in the 50s and 60s and, and the 70s, a move of God in the teaching of the coming of the Lord. That wasn't the only truth, but that was the predominant one. Then after that came the greater emphasis upon the local church, ecclesiology. And I remember how God settled things in my own heart and mind about the ministry of the Great Commission is to establish churches. And let me, let me just say this to you. After that came the move that had to do with soteriology, a return back to the preaching of the truth of the gospel of God's grace. And as that became apparent and became a strong emphasis, we saw an emphasis upon that. And uh, it seemed like that 
that the gospel would come back to us and that as churches across the land we'd be strong in the gospel again. And I want to say this to you. Anytime you start following the movement and you press the movement, whatever it is, and miss Jesus Christ, you end up fizzling in the end. Let us know truth that has set us free. And it's important that we move forward remembering that along with the gospel, the emphasis of sanctification is married to the doctrine of salvation. I, I want to say religious liberty does not replace sanctification. No. And it's very important for us to understand true soteriology and doctrine of salvation includes sanctification. Be ye holy, for I am holy is still in the Bible. Right, sir. True salvation is being saved from sin. Where is the purifying work of the Holy Spirit in our present scheme of Christianity today? I look at America. And I go in and out of the churches and they're nowhere near what they were in days gone by. We didn't have all the technology. We didn't have all the fancies, but we knew what prayer was. And we know it's must if we're going to have preaching and teaching that's in power. I want to go on to say, to get back on track, let, uh, let uh, me just Say revival is not some new movement. In Second Chronicles chapters five to seven, we have a pattern for revival. I also believe that Pentecost is a pattern for revival. I believe that there will not be another Pentecost, and I believe we have moved out of the Old Testament economy into New Testament. And yet at the same time, there are patterns that are left behind. Uh, Solomon's beautiful temple was empty until God's throne was put in place. We saw that throne being brought up by Solomon and the priest and those that had uh, helped build the temple. And as they brought it and set it in place, you'll see it in chapter 5, verses 2 to 10. The purpose was for God's glory to fill the house. Right. Well, let me just say this to you. There is no spirit-filled life where there is no lordship. Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. He rules and reigns. And when he is put on the throne of a local church, I was sitting in an ordination council just recently, and of course they were firing questions at this dear man, and uh, the council went for over three hours. They were they checked this guy on everything. I mean everything. And I was sitting there listening. And and as I was sitting there listening and witnessing this man performing very well, then all of a sudden he says, the Lord has filled his body. He has filled the universal church. But then he turned and started on some other dark, and I raised my hand. Did he fill the local church? Yes, he does. And without the feeling of the Holy Spirit in our midst, there is no real worship going to go on. There is no victorious Christian living to be lived. But what a glorious thing when we understand that spirit-filled churches or churches where they're submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And when God moves in power, he moves upon yielded hearts. If God will give revival to us here, we must be a people that believe 
that prayer works, then we have a responsibility to seek the face of God and to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, remembering that prayer begins with God. <clears throat> now I'm going to rebuke you a little. I was real disappointed last night at the prayer meeting. There's a little handful of us there. And I realize that some of our pure prayer warriors in this church are not able to do so. Not like they used to. But let me just say this to you. It's time for this younger generation to get a handle on what they're here for. Amen. It's time for you to get a handle on the Word of God and the importance of becoming spiritual leaders that you'll learn the ways of God in prayer and in the searching of the scriptures. That's good. When Moses dedicated the tabernacle, the glory came down when the work was completed and filled the tabernacle. I love it. I don't have time to deal with it, but Exodus chapter 40, verses 33 to 38. It was the song of praise that brought the glory to the temple. Tabernacle, the glory of God filled it. The priest could not minister. Wouldn't it be great if all of our intelligence was directed in let God be God? Wouldn't it be wonderful if as the people of God we would acknowledge we could do nothing without him. We need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But when it came to the dedication, of the temple, I read it in your presence, they began to use the instruments that David had perfected. David had prepared. They started playing those instruments and they started praising God. I think it would be a glorious thing if we'd go back and just look again at Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on the scene. The Bible tells us that they continued, they continued in the apostles' doctrine in fellowship and in prayer and praise and worship, breaking the bread. God help us to understand if those ingredients are not valuable to us as saints of God here at Peach Street, we are missing the reality of the presence of God. The presence of God brings glory to our God. When you question, when you worship with God's people, you come to the house of God this morning. Does your praise increase his glory in the assembly? Have you prepared your heart to come into the house of God? Have you waited before God in prayer, searched the scriptures and prayed and asked God to allow when you enter into the assembly to begin to sing and to begin to pray and to begin to hear the word of God? It will increase the glory. The tables of the law are still in the Ark of the Covenant at this time, but the pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded were no longer found. Hebrews 9, 4 tells us they were missing, they were gone. Do you know what? God can change his program anytime. Yes, sir. Now you and I can organize but God can disassemble it so fast. You say everything ought to be done decently in order. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that we've got a program and we're going to put it through whether God likes it or not. Let me just say this. It's a glorious day when God takes over a service. Amen. Yes, sir. Some things God does are temporary. And we must not make permanent institutions out of them. 
I go on to point out to you, David carefully organized the priest and the Levites. They had an order, but it was forgotten when the glory of God came down. There are times the Spirit of God ignores our plans and our procedures and rewards us with revealing God's glory in a new way. Isaiah said concerning God's way, he's done a new thing. I promise you when God Holy Spirit starts moving, it'll be relevant. And I promise you, when God, Holy Spirit, begins to move in our midst, sinners will know the difference. Let God be God. The Bible does not teach the worship of organization. We're to worship God. What about Pentecost? Acts 2 introduced God's dispensation of the church. It was the same fire and glory that moved in on the day of Pentecost. What's the purpose of the fire? To purge. What's the purpose of the glory? To indwell. God wants to indwell us. God wants to control us. God wants to work in our midst. Now, it's 12.05. And today we only have one message, unless I make it two. So I'll try to just keep it one. But let's talk about it just a moment. Fire and glory came down. What was the purpose of the fire? To devour the sacrifice. It came down and devoured the sacrifice. That's the basis of our cleansing. That's the basis of our purity. And let me just say this, without the cross, you still carry your sin. Yes, sir. But praise be to God, because of the cross, my sins have been taken away. Right. And clearly, the fire came down to purge the people, to sanctify them. And the glory came down to dwell among them. There was glory at the beginning of the service. I don't have time to go back there. You'll go to sleep on it. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 14, from the very beginning, the glory of God entered into the temple. And then the Bible tells us at the end, the glory of God was being manifest again. Let me just say, there could be no glory apart from the sacrifice that took care of our sins. Right. We are a people that have been redeemed by the blood. All of those bloody sacrifices that we'll see in this particular event of dedication of the temple was in the 20s of thousands. Bloody sacrifice. But the great power was when Jesus hung on the cross. Yes, sir. Glory to God. They all pointed to the cross. Yes. Hallelujah. We look back to the cross. Thanks be to God for the purging work of the Holy Ghost of God that makes the shed blood of Jesus Christ real in our hearts Amen. by generating grace. By regenerating grace. The cross of Christ is the is central to our worship. And when the fire of Calvary's purging comes down, it is God's revelation of the power of his shed blood. Listen at it. Isaiah chapter 6, most all of us, especially those of us that are in missions, we would want to run to Isaiah chapter 6. Both glory and fire are found on this occasion too. It's interesting that Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up and the angelic host of heaven are crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And the glory of God fills this temple. 
<laughs> and all of a sudden, the need for Isaiah to obey God, he says, as he hears the triune God speaking, who will go for us? <laughs> Isaiah said, hear my Lord, send me. But he wasn't fit to be sent until the coal was taken off the altar, burning with the blood of the bloody sacrifice, and it was brought and placed upon his lips. No one serves or worships until fire purges him. The results. You mean when they had this visitation of God and God worked in their months, there was a result? Yes. It was a lasting result. The fire and glory came as a result of purposed preparation. I just mentioned to you that preparation needs to be what it is, but we need to be open to the power of the Holy Spirit of God to overrule. But I promise you, this idea of the temple was not Solomon's. Evidently, it was God's. But there's one thing about it. God put it on David's heart. God would not allow David because he was not in a position that God would be pleased in, for he was a man of war. And here's what it What's so blessed about that? David couldn't build a temple. God wouldn't allow him. But you know what he did? He gathered the materials for the building of the temple. My prayer is that God will give us revival in this place. But until it comes, I want to be gathering materials. Amen. Put it together for the next generation. You young people may neglect the word of God in this place. You may even despise Pastor David, but let me just say this to you. If the message outlives me, I will have won. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I will have won. You say, what do you mean? Because I want to be faithful to prepare you, maybe even for what you don't even know you need. Right. That's right. Pastor Allen, same way. Pastor Bob's been the same way. David helped gather the materials and Solomon brought all the gold and the silver and the things that David had collected into the temple. And all the people stood. Glory to God. You say, what was going on? Powerful prayer. From the very beginning, Solomon was praying. Then when we get to chapter 7, the, ends, the end of the prayer, then the power of God follows. Let me further point out to you the God of glory took over. What's the result of a real Holy Spirit about God takes over? God will do great things through you. Amen if he takes over in your life. You know, I, I meet a lot of folk, well, my, my fame is I had a job and I reared my children and, and uh, I had a nice home and all that stuff. Well, you gonna take any of that to heaven with you? If we are so bent on worshiping things that we miss out on the fact that God never meant that, if you provide for your family, that's good grace. Yes, sir. That's the goodness of God. And praise be to God, you have a good job. But let me say this to you. You have a good job in all the things this world has to offer. You have nothing. If you don't have worship in your heart for the Lord Jesus and the Word of God and the things of God. <laughs> Listen to this. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God. You know what God's chief end for you is? To glorify God in your job. To glorify God in the blessings that are upon you. But the thing is, can that job, can that job give you joy? Oh yeah, pleasure. But it's for a season. 
Boy, I'm glad I've laid hold of eternal life in Christ Jesus, and I know many of you have too. And our confidence in the power and the glory of God gives us great joy. Yes, sir. I mean, I'd rather serve God than anything. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The God of glory took over, and the priests were overcome by the presence of God's glory. I don't know about you, but we could use a lot of that around here. Wouldn't it be wonderful that we got to the place that the glory of God continually manifests the attributes of God? You say, Pastor Dave, well, you say, any time that the power and the presence of God comes down on people and the glory of God is in their midst, you'll see them humble before God. You'll see them on their faces. We saw that in an old Mount Pisgah Baptist church, did we not? I mean, when God came on the scene in revival those many weeks, we were prostrate. I mean, when God came in, it's like a rushing mighty wind. And when the presence of God was manifest in our midst, the glory of God was manifest. And all of a sudden, the first thing we saw God is holy. I mean, Pastor Allen, you looked out over that congregation, and they were all on their faces. Nobody was sitting up grinning. Everybody was on their face. And they sensed the holiness of God. When God manifests his glory, here's what starts to happen. If you're in the sense of the need of assurance of salvation, he makes himself known as sufficient to eternally save you. If you're in a place that you wonder, am I loved of God? I promise you, when God's glory comes down, you will witness in your own personal need, the sufficiency of Jesus Christ to meet that love need. Yes. We can go right down the line. I don't have time for that, but sometime we will. The priest and all the people were prostrated before God. They worshiped God's holiness. It says in verse three, and they were their faces Toward the pavement, thank God and praise God for his goodness and his mercy. The Holy Ghost revival fixed a lot of stuff around here. It changed attitudes. It helped us to be humble before God. And we wouldn't have all the answers. All of a sudden, we're in search of a God that has them. They made much of the cross. In verses 5 to 7, they offered literally thousands of sacrifices. So what does that emphasize? The cross of Christ, of course. If we ever have revival, we'll be focusing on Jesus again. The priest did what God wanted them to do. I like this expression. They waited on their office. Amen. They waited on their office. Years ago, in America, when they talked about courtship, she would be said as one waiting on her bowl. Let me just say this to you. The priests were not just busy doing religious work. I hate that. It's one thing for us to do religious activity. It's another thing to be waiting for God to move on what he's doing so we can be engaged in it. They waited on their office. They weren't just trying to add to, to the ministry. They were accomplishing what the ministry was all about in God's program. And then the Levites in verse 6, praise God with music. So they have moved now from praying to fire falling and they're confessing their sin and giving thanks to God for forgiveness of sin and for his goodness and his mercy. And lastly, they had a feast. 
That's contradictory. No, it's not, brother. If God ever visits you, you have a feast. And you want everybody to be in on you. And what did they do? They went home glad. And merry in heart. Because God had chosen them as his people. Now you and I know that that had eternal ramifications. We're debtors to Israel because Israel gave us our Savior. We're debtors to Israel because God has given us his word through Israel. Can I hear an amen? Yes, but these folk went home and they were glad and they were merry at heart because God had chosen them as his people. One thing that revival does when God breathes on the people, he lets them know that he has them here for a purpose. Let me just simply say this and I'll conclude. There's nothing like a church that you know as a church. There's a lot of buildings out here with church over the door is not a true church. If God ever starts a church, his presence will be in that people. And there's potential that God will give revival to that people as they submit themselves to it. Wells, Great Britain is known as the land of revival. I used to love to think on that. I've read much on the Welsh revival. But the second country in the world has been America. A land of revival. We've had great awakenings here. You say this nation was built on Judeo-Christian principles and they have left them. But the remnant of God is still here. Yes. We're a part of that remnant. You say, Pastor David, America's gone too far. Let's let God decide that. Okay. Good. Let's hope in God. We need the fire. Yes. It needs to start in the house of God. Amen. God appears to Solomon by night and declares, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. God's house is one of sacrifice. God's house is a house of prayer. God's house is a house of praise. You say, Pastor David, what's the conclusion this morning? The conclusion this morning is this. Our God will choose places to give them revival where they have a passion for God to rule and reign in their midst. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm asking you, has God not shown himself faithful to us through the years? Has God not shown us that this place is a place of his presence and power? You're going to do it again. We've got to believe him to do it again. You say, well, what if America goes to pot? God's still God. Amen. And we're his people. And he said, I've chosen this place. I want God to choose this place. That the gospel goes out of here to the ends of the world. You say, well, it's too small. That's the phenomenal thing about it. It's that little remnant that gets the job done. It's not that big, fluffy, burning material. It's the remnant of God that gets the word done. And let's commit here. Lord, I want to be a part of the remnant I want to be in the church where I, as a part of that church, am aiding and giving glory and experience the presence and the reality of God. Why don't you stand with me, please? I'm not going to ask you to come forward this morning unless you just want to come forward. I'll offer you 
of the gospel is included in the message. But let me just go ahead and say these altars are a good place to get right. 